Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Nye Lecture 2011, sponsored by the AGU Cryosphere Focus Group. My name's Ann Nolan, and I'm the chair of the Focus Group. Before our Nye Lecture begins, we're going to recognize the 2011 recipient of the Cryosphere Young Investigator Award, Dr. Valentina Radic, which will now be presented by Regina Hawk. Thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Valentina Radic, the recipient of the Young Investigator Award for the Cryosphere this year. Um, when Valentina moved to Croatia, from Croatia to Sweden to start her PhD in glaciology after she completed her undergraduate degree in physics geophysics, she had never seen a glacier and she had a only a very vague idea about what a glacier might be. I still remember a conversation shortly after her arrival in Stockholm where she exclaimed with a hint of surprise in her voice, oh, glaciers move? <laughs> but it did not take her very long to catch up. Just 12 months later, she had her first and by now highly cited um, paper, um, um, glaciology paper and press with JGR. She found Sweden too cold and dark, so what's more obvious, she moved to the University of Alaska in Fairbanks to complete her PhD um, before she moved to a, to a postdoc position with Georg Clark at UBC Vancouver, where she is now. Valentina's, Valentina's research has focused on big questions spanning several disciplines. Most notably, she has made substantial and innovative contributions to global scale um, glacier mass balance modeling and projecting the evolution of all mountain glaciers on Earth and their contribution to sea level rise. Her global scale 100 year pro um, glacier projections are the most detailed ones up to date that have been published up to date. She has developed innovative approaches to deal with incomplete and inconsistent glacier data sets and for example, computed a new global estimate of how much ice there is outside the ice sheets. She has critically, critically explored the physical basis of volume area scaling as a tool for glacier projections, and she has carefully examined the question whether gridded climate data, such as reanalysis, regional and global climate models, can be usefully applied to large-scale glacier mo modeling. And she has shown us how to do it. Her work is characterized by great attention to detail, data, and error analysis. She actually, she simply loves quantifying and nailing down errors and uncertainties. In her relatively short career, Valentina has made substantial and enduring contributions to the field of glaciology. Her papers are highly cited and are finding prominent entry in international assessments like the Swiper Report of the Arctic Council and the coming IPCC report. She's a truly remarkable and outstanding young scientist, and it's a great, uh, also a great uh, colleague to work with. It's very enjoyable to work with her. I'm sure she will continue to make significant contributions to the cryospheric sciences in the years ahead, and I'm really glad that the AGU acknowledges her outstanding achievements with this year's Young Investigator Award. Congratulations, Valentina, and thank you for your attention. I just want to say thank you very much. I'm very, very honored, and a special thanks to the NSIDC uh, for the travel support. Thank you. Thanks. In this keynote session, we recognize the outstanding glaciological accomplishments of Dr. Tad Pfeffer with the Nye Lecture. This keynote lecture is named after John F. Nye, a pioneer in glacier science, who's a professor emeritus in physics at the University of Bristol. John Nye's paradigm-changing work in ice rheology theory allowed us to predict glacier behavior, including surging glaciers. As land ice responds to climate warming, Nye's work in ice mechanics and glacier bed dynamics is as relevant today as it was when he first developed his theories 50 years ago. Like John Nye, Tad Pfeffer is a leader in glaciology whose contributions have strongly influenced the field for over three decades. Tad's research spans spatial scales from large-scale ice sheet dynamics and sea level change to small-scale water percolation and subglacial processes. 
He employs a variety of quantitative field techniques, laboratory and modeling approaches to both modern and paleo problems. Through his work at the University of Colorado, Tad has made major contributions to our understanding of ongoing changes and dynamics of mountain glaciers, and has provided new estimates of the potential sea level contributions of large ice masses such as Greenland. He's made fundamental contributions to understanding water percolation in snow and fern, deformation and flow of glaciers, and the calving process and dynamics of tidewater glaciers. Tad is an outspoken advocate for increased awareness of the societal implications of sea level change, a topic that certainly resonates with AGU's mission to promote, promote science and benefit to society. Please welcome Dr. Tad Pfeffer. Thank you. It's an understatement to say that this is an honor and a surprise. Frankly, I thought everybody was sick of hearing me talk about this kind of thing. Um, but I thank the, uh, the cryosphere group as a whole. I also wanted to thank the, um, the, the ad hoc uh, glacier working group that I've been working with for the last oh, 10 months or so for the support that they've given for a variety of tasks that we've been, been working on. That A lot of it is filtered down into what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, but also, um, they have uh, provided a lot of, of, of support that goes beyond the immediate task um, that I've been working on. And have, just provided a lot of, of just simple moral support and advice and have been good friends as well. Um, I'm going to talk about sea level rise in, in, in broad terms and am going to make an effort to um, try to express the need for generality, but at the same time, of course, I'm going to limit my, my attention to the ice aspects of uh, sea level rise, although as I talk about these things, we can keep in mind that there are a variety of other non-ice related things that we could be worrying about, thermal expansion, gravitational redistribution, regional and local sea level effects, and so forth. So as we talk about these specific ice related things, you could keep all these other problems in mind as well. So a good place to start would be the, uh, the AR4 forecasts. Here's a plot from uh, the AR4 assessment in 2007, which showed for the variety of, of uh, forcing scenarios a range of projections for 2100 that went from about 18 centimeters to about 60 centimeters. Um, I put absence of accelerated ice sheet discharge in here because, of course, it wasn't absent. It was dealt with. Uh, here's another representation of the AR4 projections. Uh, no sooner had this come out than, than the, um, the AR4 lead authors were, um, were roundly and, and quite unfairly criticized for somehow having left out um, rapid dynamics um, from the ice sheets. And of course, they, they didn't leave them out. What they did is they dealt with them in the best way that they could. Um, and they couldn't deal with them very well because the theory and the ability to model rapid dynamic changes in the ice sheets didn't exist and that couldn't be included in numerical models. What did exist were observations showing that it was starting to happen. So they were put in this, this unfortunate position of, of having to report on the presence of some rapid dynamics in the observations, but they couldn't put them into the, into the projections. Uh, that was an awkward position to put, be put into, but they did the very best that they could with it. So, so there they were in this, this scaled up ice sheet dynamical imbalance. But that put this, um, this real um, pressure on the community to do something better um, as we head toward AR5 in coming up with sea level projections. Now, we've been doing this for a long time, you know. Um, 
There have been four IPCC assessments, and this is a list of uh, various uh, quite large-scale efforts to project sea level rise going back to 1983, and there were some uh, various scientific conferences that went on before this. We've been going at this for quite a long time. Basically, we've been projecting sea level rise as far back as there were GCM models to project future climate to drive sea level rise models. And uh, land ice contributions have been a part of these sea level rise models from the very beginning, and ice dynamics have been a part of those sea level rise projections from the very beginning, and rapid dynamics have been a part of the land ice projections. So we've got a long history of doing this, and we've been making progress um, right from the very beginning. In certain, in certain respects, in many respects, the glaciological study is a lot of people in this room know very well the glaciological study of rapid dynamics um, has been quite advanced for quite a long time. We just don't really know how to put it into a numerical model. One thing which may not be quite so apparent to people in the room is um, we haven't always had this, uh, well, you know, look at this big room we've got in the spotlight and, you know, this big, this big focus group. We haven't always had quite this... Um, this sense of exposure and attention and, and to, uh, to recognize that you only need to look at, for example, this uh, polycrestic tome, to borrow a term from its own contents, polycrestic means useful for many reasons, Mrs. Byron's Dictionary of Unusual, Obscure, and Preposterous Words, this is a very useful book, contains all kinds of, of useful terms like cuniculus, which means full of holes, windings, or rabbits. I, look, I, checked, I checked this in the OED, and it's, that's what it means. It also contains pagophagia, meaning eating a tray of ice daily for two months to help offset an iron deficiency. <laughs> that was not in the OED. But it also includes glaciology. So in 1960, when this book was published, glaciology counted as an unusual, obscure, and preposterous field of study. Well, okay, so not anymore, right? We're, we're in the spotlight now. But um, for all this time that we've put into it, the spotlight that we enjoy now, there are still a number of issues which for all the effort that we have put into them, we still cannot figure out. We're deep into diminishing returns on certain aspects of glacier mechanics and dynamics. So anyway, I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> most of these, uh, the next few graphs will be familiar to most of you, but for those of you that don't follow the soaps, I'll give you a, a quick um, overview here of, of a few of the, uh, just a few of the uh, reports of uh, glacier and ice sheet loss rates subsequent to AR4. So this is from a paper by Castaneda and Lovell in 2010. These are loss rates from um, Antarctica above and Greenland below. So this is the Antarctic loss rates. And these are box plot diagrams, if you're not familiar with them. Time on the horizontal axis running from 1992 up to 2008. And then loss rate vertically going down to about um, 300 gigatons a year. Now these screens are both too far away for me to read. Um, East Antarctica above here, slightly positive because East Antarctica is still gaining mass, West Antarctica below. The boxes, the, uh, the, the lateral extent of the boxes indicate the time period and the vertical extent is the uncertainty. Um, the, each box is a different publication and this is Greenland down below going down to about 300 gigatons per year again. So you can see the various different authors are not in total agreement upon what's happening, but there is a, uh, a progressive decline, probably with an acceleration um, in both cases, except for East Antarctica. Here's what the glaciers look like. Uh, the, the axes here are quite different. For one thing, this goes back into the 19th century. Um, and the range in the vertical is quite different. This goes to a little bit over 500 gigatons per year. And in fact, if you plotted the range of the previous two graphs, everything in the Antarctic box would fit into that, and everything in the Greenland box would fit into this. Um, but the 
glacier data actually only goes out as far as 2005. Now, this is as of about, um, well, this, uh, the glacier plot here is from 2006, but this was the state of affairs as of about uh, six or eight months ago, okay? So we, we had this sort of general idea of what was happening, um, although we didn't have any additional data for the glaciers, and we, what we were doing with the glacier data is we kept sort of rehashing the 2005 uh, data, uh, trying to, to rework it in different ways to try to understand um, if, if we could get a little bit better uh, handle on what it, um, what, what it may be uh, looking like in, in the present. So there's been a lot of effort devoted toward trying to, well, keep track of what's happening with these rapidly changing values and improve our ability to uh, assess these things accurately and rapidly. Um, if you compare these summations to actual direct observations of the ocean, you can actually close the budget pretty well. So for 2003 to 2007, again from Castaneda and Lovell, you can close the budget to within about a half or 0.05 millimeters per year. So we're in, in fairly good agreement, although again, we're using glacier data that's, that, that we, we stopped having new data in 2005. Okay, so now we need to try to get to the future. We need to start trying to project. And we've got two principal problems that we have to deal with. Principal problems. For the ice sheets, we have to figure out how we're going to model fast dynamics. And I want to add to this, we also have to deal with surface mass balance because that's not a closed book, okay? We don't understand how surface mass balance works um, entirely at all. For glaciers, we have the problem of the fact that we've got 200,000 or more of them, and somehow we have to manage the problem of observing all of these glaciers and somehow aggregating those measurements and then also modeling them in the aggregate somehow and carrying them forward. And also, we have to think about dynamics of the glaciers because they're not all land terminating. They also have the capacity for fast dynamic behavior. So we've got to deal with those. So let's talk a little bit about what's involved in doing those. First of all, dynamics um, is, it, it, that term has been used quite carelessly, and this wasn't a central issue in this problem with what, it, what was meant by leaving out dynamics in, at um, AR4, but it, it added to the confusion. Because, I mean, of course, dynamics works all the time in every glacier. Dynamics is, it's the, it's the DDT term there in the continuity equation. Whenever a glacier responds to a change and dH dt is non-zero, there are dynamics taking place. So, you know, if the glacier were in steady state, dQ dx would equal b dot and, and everything would be fine. The glacier would have found this magic geometry that matches the mass balance environment and it could just sit perfectly still. But as soon as anything happens to change that, dH dt has to turn on and it has to change. And so there is a change in geometry that leads the glacier toward a state of equilibrium. So that's what I think of as normal dynamics. But you can also have a disequilibrium, or you could call it fast dynamics, which is different because the change in geometry leads away from an equilibrium state. And that's the way, that's the way I think of the difference of the kind of dynamics that we have trouble modeling versus the kind of dynamics that exists all the time. Dynamics that leads away from an equilibrium state versus dynamics that leads toward an equilibrium state. And the best way to, um, to describe disequilibrium dynamics is simply to look at it happening. And the best way to do that is with a time lapse. So let's look at it here at Columbia Glacier, where we can watch the Columbia Glacier in coastal Alaska retreat over a two-year period. We're looking at about a two and a half kilometer wide terminus with about 100 meters of ice standing above the surface and about 500 meters of grounded ice below the water line, flowing initially at about, uh, where are we, 2008, about 15 meters a day. It will slow down um, eight, uh, just about, well, 
maybe it's already gone through it, it's slowed down to about 15, 10 meters a day and then sped up again to about 20 meters a day. But fast in any case, because what's happening here is the ice is moving very fast, but the calving is going faster, and so the glacier is retreating. And this is dynamics, which is moving the glacier away from its equilibrium state. Basically, it's eating up the ablation zone and changing the geometry of the glacier very fast for reasons that really don't have anything to do with the glacier's mass balance. And so that's what this rapid dynamics is about. And that's what was happening in Greenland right as AR4 was being wrapped up. Everybody knew that it was starting to happen in Greenland, so they had to talk about it happening, but they didn't know how to model it, so they couldn't project it. So the challenge is to understand how that happens well enough to be able to project it. And the problem is that we don't really know how to do that. And if you've been going to the various different sessions on modeling and subglacial processes, you've been hearing a lot of details about that. We've been making a lot of progress in various different aspects of this, but we can't, we can't tie it all together yet. For glaciers, we have a rather different set of problems. One of them is upscaling mass balance measurements. You, know, you, can, you can, the most direct and immediate way of determining the mass balance of a glacier is to actually go to the glacier and make a point measurement. And whether you're digging a pit or, you, or you're doing energy balance measurements, you actually have to do an in situ measurement at a point. And then you have to somehow figure out how to make one or a few measurements representative of the glacier as a whole. If you've got the measurement on one or a few glaciers, you have to make that representative of a region, and then you have to make a, a, some number of regions representative of the globe. So you have an upscaling problem. How are you going to do that? And the extraordinary thing is that we actually have an astonishingly small amount of data to do this with. Like any variable time series, long, continuous records are extremely valuable. And globally, if you want, records going back 40 years or more, they're unbroken. We only have 37 of them in the world. If you're, if, you're, if you're happy with records that are only one year long, then okay, we got about 500. But if you want a record that's 40 years long, going back to 1970, there are only 37 of them. So this upscaling, we're doing a really long reach. Let's look at Alaska. Um, as an example of this, the yellow dots show glaciers where there are measurements. You can see them around here. The long, the, the long measurements, the, the, the long-term the long measurements in Alaska are at the, the Wolverine Glacier there. And this is going to be a problem again because I can't read the screen really. And the the, the Gulcana, this is really a problem, I really can't, I can't, okay, okay, now I can, now I can do it. There's the Gulcana up there. These are two of the really long-term records. McCall Glacier is off the map um, in the Brooks Range. It has an even longer record, but it's discontinuous. The U.S. Geological Survey gets great credit for these, first of all, for having started these records in the first place, back around a little bit after IPY, and second for putting the support into maintaining these records into the future. And a lot of that has to do with the establishment of the, um, these climate science centers under um, Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. This has been a, a tremendous um, boon for Alaskan glaciology. Uh, there have been other agencies that have put a lot of uh, really valuable resources into this. National Park Service has contributed a great deal in Alaska. Um, uh, University of Alaska, Fairbanks, and also uh, UA South and Juneau. Um, Alaska Pacific University um, have been, been working here as well. And Crell has um, got weather stations and web cameras operating at Columbia Glacier and also at Hubbard Glacier. But the other thing to notice is that the, the, uh, they're all over here. And of course, this is where, this is where the action is in the Wrangell St. Elias. This is where all the snow is. And this is, a, this is a concession to uh, practicality and the fact that um, it's extremely difficult to do work here. And you can, you can imagine the situation back when, when, the, when the, the, the global mass balance uh, system was being devised back, so not four score and seven years ago, but IPY anyway, when our fathers brought forth upon this 
continent of new science plans conceived in Washington, D.C., and dedicated to the proposition that all glaciers are created equal. So you only have to measure a few of them, and then you can upscale to the rest of the, of the world. So they're all sitting around the table looking at a map, and they're saying, OK, well, we're going to stay away from this place because it snows a whole lot there, and it's going to be just impossible to work. OK, so, you, so you, get, you get how that works? When I measure mass balance, don't do it there because it snows a lot. This is like you lost your wallet over there, but I'm going to look for it there because the light's better. Well, it, it's actually it's not that bad. But there, there is there's this very practical aspect to doing this, is this is an extremely difficult area to maintain a long-term mass balance program. It's going to be extremely logistically expensive and chancy to do it. And these are, the reason the mass balance programs over here are quite frankly because the glaciers are smaller and they're easier to get to. But are these representative of the Wrangell St. Elias? Well, we hope they are, but we don't really know. And we don't even have any high mountain weather stations here. It's still kind of a guess. So anyway, one way to get around this, of course, is to do something other than in situ measurements, like airborne measurements. Chris Larson at the University of Alaska is doing this with an um, airborne laser in a small airplane. But there are many ways of doing this. You can do this with airborne uh, altimetry. You can do it with satellite altimetry. You can do it with GRACE. You can do it with repeat um, mapping. Uh, this is just one example it's from Alex Gardner. He talked about this uh, earlier today. This is in the Canadian Arctic. This is a combined study published earlier this year <coughs> uh, comparing uh, GRACE repeat mapping and altimetry in the Canadian Arctic, where he found the tripling of mass loss from the eastern Canadian Arctic uh, between 2004, 5, and 7, 9. Um, so we can combine these methods to get a, a, a picture of what the mass balance of glaciers is doing. Doing this for glaciers rather than ice sheets has got some particular problems to it associated with the fact that you've got all of these little bodies rather than a single body. So the, the problems are slightly different. And now we've got the question of, well, what do we upscale to? And Anthony Arendt spoke this morning about this, this inventory. The other extraordinary thing is that up until just recently, our inventory, our knowledge of where the glaciers are in the world and how big they are. So this isn't just a matter of, of the total area or volume of ice in the world, but what's the volume, what's the area distribution? What's the area elevation distribution? We only knew that for about 48% of the glaciers in the world. And even that was brought up from about, I think, 40% to 48% by Graham Cogley in around 2009. This increase from 48% to nearly 100% has been accomplished by this group of about 40 contributors in less than a year um, in anticipation of, of AR5. And I, I think it's just a magnificent accomplishment. It's amazing to me that we were able to do this, especially in view of the fact that so much of this was done essentially as volunteer work. Um, and this really makes it possible to get a new picture of what is going on um, with global glaciers. And in that connection, I want to show you one other thing. And this actually isn't using the new inventory yet, but this is from Graham Cogley. This, was, um, this is just coming out. In a, this is actually a chapter from a book called The Future of the World's Glaciers. This is the latest pentade for global glaciers. So the blue line is glaciers. The red line is the Antarctic ice sheet. The yellow line is the Greenland ice sheet. And so for the most recent pentade, the global glaciers have taken a big drop from over 1.2 millimeters per year sea level equivalent to about 0.77 millimeters per year sea level equivalent. So the, the things to notice here are, first of all, that the, the three categories, Greenland ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet, and glaciers are all about equal contributors. The signals have a lot of interannual variability. And the other, the other thing to note is that since what we're interested in for sea level is the sum of all the numbers, so whether they rise or fall, it's the change that we're interested in. We need to add them up. So we've got to, we've, we've got to track them whichever direction they're going. <clears throat> OK. So let's get on with projections. 
Richard Alley has talked about this, the fat tail, the high impact, low, prob low probability event, collapse of the West Antarctic, for example. Um, and he sketched out a probability distribution function, and that's a good way to look at it, particularly because planners, coastal engineers, policymakers, risk managers, and so forth like to think about this thing in terms of probability distribution functions. And down here, these are, again, these are the, the high impact, low probability events. And up here are lower impact, so let's call this maybe a one meter sea level rise by 2100, and you're say maybe a two meter sea level rise by 2100. This is a lower impact, but a higher probability events. <clears throat> If you were to get out your, um, your AGU uh, uh, schedule and categorize things into uh, the, the sessions that pertain more to the fat tail, like collapse of the West Antarctic, say, and things that pertain more to um, the, the peak here, lower impact, like completing the glacier inventory, and then walk around and look in the rooms, I think that you would probably find that the fat tail events probably have more people in the rooms. They tend to be the more, um, the, the, the more well, exciting things, the, the bigger, more attention-getting, um, scientifically sort of, you know, grab you by the collar events. Um, the big stuff. The problem is that the details here are still actually the event which is most likely to occur. And if you are a planner or a policymaker, the situation becomes even more pronounced because, for one thing, planners, policymakers, coastal engineers, they, they think on a different time scale than we do. You know, they think more on, um, well, I put 2050 here, but you could just as easily put 2020. There, they're interested in 2100, but, but only really quite remotely. And they're not interested in 2100 um, and nothing in between. They're not going to wait until 2100 and then start doing something. If they're going to know about 2100, they need, to know, they need to do things as we get to 2100. So they're going to need to know about 2015, 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050. They need to know about things on the very near time scale. So in, th in that case, everything becomes details. And you have to add up the numbers, and you have to think about things on very short time scales. So at that level, the details really matter. <clears throat> Having said that, though, you, you, can, you can go too far with that idea. Um, this is a picture from a, um, a project to uh, come up with conceptual plans for Manhattan and the whole mouth of the Hudson River under two meters higher sea level by 2100. That was um, actually culminated in an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art uh, called Rising, Rising Seas. And this was a design that was um, done by um, Stephen Cassell and Adam Urinsky at the um, um, Architectural Research Office and uh, Susanna Drake at Island Designs um, called A New Urban Ground. And there's actually there's quite a lot in here. There are um, storm surge barriers, wetlands, there are canals going into this is, you know, Manhattan Island. There are buildings that have been removed. But tucked in back there, and you can't see it here, you have to look in the design plans, there's a two meter seawall. It's, it's a levee. And I was speaking with one of the principals about this, and I asked them if. I mean, given the fact that if you're anticipating two meters of sea level rise by 2100, then it's pretty reasonable to expect three meters by 2050. And was that part of their design? And they said, well, no. So somewhere in there, the, the, the plan that was given to them implicitly included the idea that, that, that sea level would come to two meters by 2100, and then it would stop. So. We need to think about the short term, but you can't forget about the long term. So the, the message here is that we really have to think, this is one of my points, is that we really have to think on the time scales 
of the people who are essentially our clients. And this is the sense in which we have become engineers. And that we're, we're no longer in the, the, the pure, we're no longer playing the pure science game that we were 40 years ago when glaciology was obscure and preposterous. We, we've now actually become an applied science where there is a specific group with a specific need for solutions to the problems that we are trying to solve. And so we have an obligation to solve some of the problems that we are working on according to their terms and among other things to think about things on, on their timetable and, and answer their questions. By their timetable, I mean if they need to know what sea level is going to do by 2030, 2050, it's not going to help for us to say, well, we don't really know about that, but let me tell you what's going to happen in 2500. Let's look a little bit at some of the recent modeling results. Um, I'm just going to look at these quickly. These are all uh, recent publications. This is from Yoshimori and Abiyuchi. This is uh, just a modeling of uh, surface mass balance for the Greenland ice sheet. This goes all the way out to 2300, but if you look at the arrows here, this is for 2100, and we're getting about 1 to 15 centimeters of sea level rise, um, just again from surface mass balance at 2100. This is a paper um, that was in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy by Price and others, where they did something very imaginative. They, they, they looked at three outlet glaciers in Greenland, Jakobshavn, Kangalitsuak, and Helheim, and they experimented with turning them on and off on certain schedules. They'd let them run for a while, and then they'd stop them, and they'd turn them on again, and they'd see what the cumulative sea level rise was, and then they'd upscale that to all of Greenland, and what they came up with was an, an upper bound for dynamic losses from Greenland by 2100 of about four and a half centimeters. And here's a, uh, here's a, a real grab bag of, of modeling results for glaciers, and I just put in about six different cases here for uh, glaciers, again going out to 2100, and these all range from about 5 to 25 centimeters, and I've got several different types here. There's just straight um, surface mass balance models driven by GCM. Some of them are modeling um, whole regions using uh, temperature index methods. Others are modeling individual glacier by glacier. There are some power law models. There's straight extrapolation um, by, by limit seeking. What I'm talking about are my, uh, this was the, the Pfeffer et al. kinematic constraints. Um, paper, I, I used uh, two of my, my low, low end um, models there. Some of these include calving discharge, some of them don't, some of them include the peripheral ice caps around, ice caps and glaciers around the ice sheets, some don't. So 5 to 25 centimeters. Okay, so now what I want to think about is alternatives to just straight modeling. The reason for this is, as I said before, we've been, we've been beating the fully deterministic model pretty hard for a lot of years. And as I said, we're, we're deep into diminishing returns. And um, I mean, I'm not really a modeler myself, but um, I feel pretty confident in suggesting that the big breakthrough is not coming next week. Um, it's going to take longer than that. And, it would be worth spending some more effort than we are in exploring on a parallel track alternative methods. And we've done some of that already, but I think it would be worth um, doing a little bit more of this. One of the ones that we've done already involves extrapolation. I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, this is from um, Meyer et al. in, in 2007 which I was also a co-author on, where we took the, um, the, the rate of mass loss, and I've, I've drawn it here as a curve going up because I'm thinking of sea level rising, and then we took that rate, of, that rate of, of sea level rise from Greenland, from Antarctica, and from glaciers and ice caps, and then we just ran it forward into the future under two assumptions. One of them is that things didn't get any better or they didn't get any worse. So we just ran out into the future with a straight line. And then the other one is that the trend the acceleration remained the same, and that's the, that's the curved line. 
that goes into the future. And if you've, if you've read the old the, the, the Limits to Growth from the Club of Rome, you, you, you know all about you know, what a bad idea extrapolation is. Although actually, there, this, um, the, the, the Club of Rome has experienced a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a resurrection lately. Um, sort of, a, sort of a, a, a recovery of its tainted reputation, although if you read it, it sounds a little bit like sort of the recovery of Nixon's reputations. It's very uh, um, qualified. Um, there's all kinds of ways to get into trouble with extrapolation. And we tried to avoid it here by doing this bracketing scenario, the idea that um, the straight line, um, that probably lies underneath what's actually going to happen. Things are probably not going to slow down below what they are now. And the, the continued acceleration probably lies above what's actually going to happen. That was our thinking, anyway, and came up with these um, projections here by 2100 for total sea level rise from um, land ice loss, 56 centimeters from um, in, the, in the continued acceleration case and about 17 centimeters from glaciers and ice caps. Now, Eric Reno did something quite similar using a very comprehensive set of data for Greenland and Antarctica um, extending from 1992 to 2009, here shown combined. He put a linear fit through this and came up with this trend here, uh, 36 gigatons per year squared. Ran that forward in a similar fashion, but just took a single curve through it, basically continued acceleration, and came up with these numbers below. He arrived by 2050 at 15 plus or minus two centimeters per year um, and then added to that for glaciers and ice caps, and he was, he was, here he was simply taking the number from Meyer et al. for 20, 2050, added eight centimeters, from, used thermal expansion, taking numbers from AR4 of nine centimeters, to come up with a total sea level rise of 32 centimeters by 2050. Um, I did some experiments using this, um, the, the same data in this graph here, um, with a colleague of mine, Balaji Rachagopalan, at the University of Colorado. And we used a slightly different method rather than a simple least squares fit. We did a generalized linear method, um, which allowed us, among other things, to pass. This is, a, this is a projection interval going into the future, which allows us, among other things, to have uncertainties which expand as you go into the future, which they really should do. Um, and by 2100, we come out here with this is for Antarctica alone, uh, 25 centimeters plus or minus 16. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is this is using all the data from 1992 to 2009. If you leave off the first two years of the sequence, so just use 1994 to 2009, it changes from this to this. That's getting rid of the first two years. These extrapolations are extremely sensitive to what you feed them. So, again, you can get into all kinds of trouble doing this. Um, nevertheless, <clears throat> go ahead and do it anyway. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I do this, actually, is I, I think it's less interesting to look at what it says about sea level than what it says about the growth of uncertainty as you go into the future. How rapidly does the uncertainty expand? And what we saw here, going to 2100, and in a sense, you know, it doesn't matter how far into the future you go because what you're looking at is simply the shape of a statistical expression, okay? You go out to 2100, we came up with 57 centimeters plus or minus 13 for ice sheets plus global glaciers. Eric came up with 56 just for the ice sheets alone by 2100. And so the first question to ask is, does it make any sense to believe these extrapolations going all the way out to 2100? And in his paper, Eric said it's probably not a good idea to go all the way to 2100. And I think that it probably is, is not a good idea. You think about what's involved in making an extrapolation like this, and now these curves are going down because I'm thinking of mass loss leaving a glacier. The black line is just continued acceleration. So an extrapolation like this always assumes stationarity. 
the idea that whatever processes are controlling this curve during the period when you fitted the curve to the data continues to operate on into the future. So in the case of ice sheet disappearing, if this is rapid dynamics, you know, rapid outlet glacier, these glaciers continue to accelerate as long as you run this curve out into the future. So are these outlet glaciers going to continue to go faster and faster and faster all the way to 2100? Probably not. There's probably a time scale after which something else happens. And the red and the blue curve here are two suggestions. The red curve, maybe you get to the end here and it stabilizes and I have a straight line going down and things are diminishing at some new rate, but it's steady after that point. The blue curve, this process ends and it stabilizes and it, it, it stops. That process is over. So perhaps what you could do, if you wanted to experiment with the Greenland ice sheet, is you could think about a transient process like this and you could assign that to each one of the outlet glaciers and if you could get a handle on what the time scale of that process was and what the interval between events was, you could turn them on and off and then you could aggregate them, you could sort of convolve them. That starts to sound a whole lot like what Steve Price did, doesn't it? So there may be an opportunity to actually combine and create a sort of a hybrid numerical modeling with a bit of this sort of extrapolation where you can replace portions of the numerical modeling strategy with something much simpler like extrapolation. Very briefly, for glaciers, an alternative, this is an idea which Dave Barr is, um, we, we would like to pursue this. I don't know if we're going to be able to or not, but by, um, this is a rather busy diagram, this is trying to get everything onto one slide, but um, by using um, volume area scaling, response time area scaling, and volume AAR scaling, it's possible to actually model glaciers in the aggregate. And the, the real trick to this is if you have a distribution of glaciers, you could use a GCM to calculate what a mass balance change would be. If you know where the glaciers are located, because you have a good inventory, you remember we're getting a good inventory? Use that good inventory and the, mass, and the modeled mass balance to come up with a new volume. The new volume through scaling gives you a new AAR. A new AAR plus the hypsometry gives you a new ELA. The new ELA and the inventory allows you to place your glaciers in the new environment and you can repeat the process. But you don't let them go all the way to equilibrium. You use your, you use your um, your time scaling to only allow the process, only allow the adjustment to go a certain portion of the way depending upon the size of your time step. And by doing that, you can allow the glaciers to adjust partially and you can do this for a distribution of glaciers rather than an actual population of glaciers. You could actually do it either way. If you work with a distribution of glaciers, then if at any point you actually need the actual glacier population, you could generate it stochastically. Okay, last two things I want to do are to, first of all, take a look at some of these uh, published results that I've showed you side by side. This is a plot showing um, sea level rise out to, so here's, here's the observational record going out to this line here is 2010, here's 2100, and here's a collection of different projections, okay? The, uh, the gray line, the, the gray curve down here is the bottom of the Romsdorf projection. You can kind of see the top of it hiding in back there. The blue line up here is Vermeer and Romsdorf. The hatched line inside, or the hatched area inside, is the Grinstead 2009 projection. This uh, pink triangle here is this Balaji projection that, uh, that Balaji Rajagopalan and I were experimenting with that I told you about a little while ago. 
And over here, these didn't have um, time series connected with them. So these are just ranges. These all apply at 2100. These bars here are the AR4 projections at 2100, the various different scenarios. This is the Meyer et al. 2007 projection. This red thing here is the Pfeffer et al. kinematic constraints projection. This thing here is an, is an average, or, or the range, rather, of um, 15 semi-empirical models, which I did not get a chance to talk about. And I've got a, one other version of this, because you get too many of these things on here all at once, and it gets terribly confusing. I took off the Balaji and Pfeffer and, and put on the uh, um, Katzman 2011. And the extraordinary thing about this to me is that everybody is kind of zeroing in on the same thing. And these are coming from totally different approaches. But there is really a substantial amount of agreement. Now, before you get too busy patting yourselves on the back, this is the projection that was made in 1990 by the first IPCC assessment. So we, we, can, we can ask how much progress we've made in 20 years. Um, nevertheless, it is, it, it's really interesting to me that uh, these projections are clustering as well as they are. But there is one other point, and that is the, the magnitude of the uncertainty or the spread in these projections at 2100. It's, it's a spread on the order of a meter, and it raises the question again of should we be making projections as far out as 2100? And second, what are the consequences of really having large uncertainties? And so the last point I want to make is large uncertainties. And I want to look at this from the point of view of a policymaker or a decision maker. If you're responsible for trying to manage the, you know, Coastal Louisiana, for example. Uh, in general, you don't like large uncertainties, but not being given uncertainties is far worse. Again, um, planners want probability distribution functions. In other words, they want uncertainties. That's different than not giving any projection at all, no uncertainties. Uh, giving a projection 500 or 1,000 years into the future doesn't really mean much of anything to a decision maker. And giving an overestimate can be just as costly as giving an underestimate. And let me give you a couple of examples of that. First one here, suppose that you, you do something which causes you to change your estimate of sea level rise to 10 times more than what you said before. And you go to a, you go to a planner and you say, well, OK, um, it's going to cost you, um, you know, it, sea level rise is going to be 10 times greater. The planner might say, okay, well, it's going to cost us 10 times more to deal with this. Or, probably more likely, they're going to say, I guess we can only afford to save 10% of our coastline. Which 90% are we going to sacrifice? And so they're going to start performing triage. And you, you don't want to do that unnecessarily. Another example, as soon as you establish a projected sea level rise, you also draw a line on the map showing the extent of inland incursion. And when you do that, that alters the perceived value of the land on the seaward side of that line immediately. And it's hard to say what that alteration is, but it's going to have an effect. And again, you don't want to do that unnecessarily. And the final thing is that if you give a very wide range of uncertainty, that uncertainty is going to be used um, as political leverage by, by, by entities basically um, using, um, creating sort of my scenario is better than yours situations where making progress in decision making becomes virtually impossible. Now, obviously, we're never going to reduce uncertainties to zero. And no matter how small the uncertainties are, this is always going to happen. 
but we do want to work to try to minimize that by making the uncertainties as small as, as we can. Again, there are other factors than purely scientific factors at work that we need to be aware of because we're no longer purely scientists in this role. We're also engineers with all these practical constraints acting on us, whether we like it or not. We could think about what I've called a projection horizon here, and this is a kind of uncertainty that it, it's, it goes beyond simply having a, a bracketed plus or minus that keeps getting bigger as you go out in the future. You could assign a time beyond what you say, we just don't know what's going to happen at this point. Doing things like um, establishing a time scale for dynamics, that's a way of um, establishing time scales in the future where your ability to understand what's happening beyond that point changes. And I don't know how you would apply that in the, the broad sense to sea level projections, but for certain parts of sea level rise, you might want to think about doing that. And I also don't know where it would, where it would go if I myself had to decide how far can I see into the future and sea level rise. I start getting uncomfortable after about three or four decades. That's just me. Um, but 2100, one of the puzzles for me, where did 2100 come from? That's a question that I've, I've, I've asked. At what point did we decide that 2100 was the number that we wanted to forecast for? I've never been able to find the answer to that question. Okay, well, this is my, my list of sort of summary conclusions that I don't really think I need to, to read to you. We've, we've discussed them. I think they're pretty much self-evident. I know better than to stand between this crowd and drinks, so I think I will, I will um, close my mouth and look at this way. Thank you. Thank you all. Before we head over to the cryosphere reception, Tad is available for questions here for several minutes, and I'm going to step aside and let him field the questions. If you wouldn't mind repeating the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, 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 the question was, or the state statement was that the IPCC has, has already sort of established 2100 as this, as this horizon, and am I suggesting that maybe we move that, move that up? Um, first of all, the, the IPCC actually, um, I don't think that they, they have um, considered 2100 as the horizon um, and not and are not considering sea level rise after that time. Um, and um, the, the 2100 didn't originate with the IPCC. That was already in place before the IPCC existed. Um, but there, there have been discussions of um, the, the longer term sea level rise. But um, the, the 2100 didn't come from um, it, that, that was not a request from the 
you know, from the, from the policymaking community, um, as, I, as I said, I, in, in asking around, I was never able to find out where that came from. I think it was probably one of those things where, you know, 35, 40 years ago, somebody said, how far back do you think we should look? 2100? Sure. You know? <laughs> So I don't, I don't think that's ever really been codified, but I, I think it would really be worth looking at why that number is, is where it is. And, and, and who, um, who needs to know for 2100? Maybe we're beating ourselves to death over a number that nobody needs. I'm not sure. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I think I am imagining a situation where um, the this this whole sea level enterprise um, has more clout than it does. I mean, yeah, we've been drawing lines on the map for a long time, but to what purpose? This is not like the lines on on the map that. Um, you know, we're not telling anybody you have 20 years to vacate property seaward of this line because we're condemning it, you know. Um, you know, if, if we're going to draw a line on a map and then really act on it, it could be quite a different situation. But yeah, you're right. Um, you know, maybe it won't make any difference at all. And yeah, I mean, certainly coastal property hasn't taken a nosedive anywhere yet. Yeah. Yeah. I was you know, the policymakers, well, from, from engineers' perspective, um, once sea level, once, once the, um, the response time gets beyond the lifetime of infrastructure, it, it becomes much less important to do anything because you're going to have to rebuild everything anyway. So there is, a, there is a rate of sea level rise that, in some sense, doesn't matter. Um, and in that case, the issues probably become things like, um, you know, storminess. So that, yeah, the, the, the line of inundation may not be a, uh, well, all of those, all of those, all of those caveats all depend upon the, on the notion that that this will at some point be taken seriously. And you could question that anyway, right? This could entirely be an academic exercise. I mean, we would hope not. Now, these people want to get to the reception. Let's... What? I can't, I can't, oh, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you said it's, talking about 2050 instead of 2100 is a good way to make it less academic. I think that's very true. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, there are all kinds of other things that I have not touched on. For example, you get out very far into the future and, for example, all kinds of other unknowns come into play and, and what sea level is going to actually do just becomes one more unknown. Um, for, for example, getting um, the kind of society that we live in to act in an organized you know, act in an organized fashion toward a distant goal that's 100 years away, um, there's no guarantee that we can do that. So, and and that, that, kind of, that kind of factor is a serious concern. Okay, well, I think, I think we're done. Thank you all very much. Thank you.